Hamas is running out of options. Israel is squeezing the Hamas army of terror, cutting it off from its lifeline of terror tunnels from Rafah into Egypt. Hamas's only way to survive this war is to generate international pressure on Israel to leave it alone. That is why it is trying to engineer a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Because Hamas wants to make Israel look bad. The worse things get for the people of Gaza, the better they get for their Hamas warlords. Israel created humanitarian routes, so Hamas shot at the humanitarian routes. Israel brought in aid trucks, so Hamas hijacked aid trucks. Israel marked out a humanitarian safe zone, so Hamas fired rockets from inside the humanitarian safe zone. Nowhere is safe in Gaza, because Hamas has made it a war zone. Now Israel is asking Gazan civilians to evacuate parts of the humanitarian zone in Khan Yunis for their own safety, because Hamas made it unsafe again. Hamas wants civilians to die. That's why it's shooting rockets at Israeli towns from inside areas where Israel wants to protect civilians. The world should be angry at Hamas. The world should be angry at UN agencies refusing to help evacuate civilians to safety and keeping them inside a war zone and Hamas strongholds. Just yesterday, Hamas tried firing another terror rocket at Israel from inside the central Gaza Strip. Tried because, like so many Gaza rockets, this one fell short of the people it was trying to murder in Israel. Instead, that Hamas rocket slammed into a Gazan school where it could have murdered many Gazans. If the UN and international media are silent about Hamas's intended target, will they at least condemn Hamas for an attack on a Gazan school? Or will they ignore it or blame Israel instead? More than one in five rockets fired from Gaza at people in Israel instead land inside Gaza. Around 30,000 rockets have been fired at Israel over the last few years, over 10,000 in the last year alone. That means Gazan terror groups have fired over 6,000 rockets at the people of Gaza themselves. Remember the Al Ahli hospital incident in October? When a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket struck a Gaza hospital in October, international media immediately, reflexively blamed Israel based on a Hamas press release. So why should Hamas stop endangering Gazan lives? The world is telling them it works. For Hamas, the people of Gaza aren't just human shields. They're human sacrifices. The world must stand with Israel and the people of Gaza and hold Hamas accountable for attacking Israel's children from behind Gaza's children. Now, we've warned here of the danger of bringing the fatah run Palestinian Authority back into the Gaza Strip. Just like Hamas Fatah incites its people to murder Jews. Just like Hamas Fatah can claim many murderers of Jews among its ranks. Murderers of Jews from both groups get millions from Fatah in the pay for slay. That's the salary scheme for jails for, for Palestinian terrorists inside Israeli jails, generously funded, of course, by you, foreign taxpayers. And Fatah was running Gaza when Hamas took over in a bloody coup in 2007. Now Hamas and Fatah have announced that they've signed a unity deal. Palestinians don't all think the same. Like in any society, there are differences. Hamas is a bit more religious, Fatah is a bit more secular. A Palestinian poll, however, found that three quarters of Palestinians supported the October 7th massacre, just three months later. Last month, the same, fa the same poll found similar support, eight months after October 7th, with 57% of people in Gaza saying that the October 7th massacre was the correct decision by their government. But Hamas and Fatah agree on one thing, from the river to the sea. That means no Israel. The Palestinian Authority says it wants two states while chanting from the river to the sea. That means they want a state from the river to nine miles away from the sea so they can sprint the remaining distance. That's what Hamas and Fatah mean when they say they want a state plus a right of return to Israel. They want one Palestinian state and another state that is open to unlimited Palestinian immigration till it becomes Palestinian state number two. For the Palestinians, the two-state solution means solving Israel with two Palestinian states. Lots of international diplomats are talking about a revitalized Palestinian authority to govern Gaza after the war. Now that meant letting Hamas govern Gaza 
through the back door because Fatah said that it would give control to Hamas if it won elections and said that it's an integral part of the Palestinian mosaic. But if this deal really goes through, then PA rule in Gaza means returning Hamas to Gaza through the front door on a red carpet. The Hamas rapists who declared war on Israel's people on October 7th must be defeated, not rewarded, and definitely not led back into Gaza in triumph. Fatah, who's Secretary General Jibri Rajoub celebrated the barbaric massacres of October 7th, needs to be called out, not empowered to spread more hate. Rajoub, by the way, leads the Palestinian Olympic Committee, something to think about ahead of the Paris Games. The Israeli people want peace. Peace must always be advanced and celebrated. But we should all be beware of a kind of peace that will only help Hamas and the Palestinian movement make war to destroy Israel. We'll take some questions from our audience watching on the live feed now. Our first question today comes from Instagram Live, where Yael asks, what sort of impact will the new unity agreement between Hamas and Fatah have on the day after in Gaza? First of all, don't hold your breath. Unity between Hamas and Fatah has always been the holy grail of Palestinian politics. And if I had a dollar every time they announced that there was a unity deal that then didn't happen, I'd be, uh, well, I'd have enough money to, uh, to rebuild Gaza after the destruction that Hamas has brought on it. But here's what it means. For months we've been warning that letting the PA into Gaza means letting Hamas in through the back door. Why through the back door? Because the Palestinian Authority says Hamas is an integral part of the Palestinian national movement. You can't destroy it, and if they win elections, we'll give them power. But if Hamas and Fatah really go ahead with this unity deal, it means letting Hamas into Gaza through the front door, and that's not going to happen. Even worse, Potentially, it could mean some sort of power sharing in the West Bank, where Israel right now is trying to fight Hamas, which is trying to set the region on fire and eventually claim control of the West Bank. By the way, the October 7th massacre has only made Hamas more popular among Palestinians in the West Bank because it's seen as bravely standing up against Israel and doing something about this country that the vast majority of Palestinians think has no right to exist at all. So we need to be very cautious and cut through the nonsense when they talk about pursuing a Palestinian state on 1967 lines. They're not talking about a Palestinian state next to Israel. They're talking about a Palestinian state as a staging ground and a springboard for a war to take the rest of Israel. That's what they mean by saying a right of return. They mean in the West Bank and Gaza, we want to have one Palestinian state. And then we think that uh, Palestinians should have an unlimited right of immigration into Israel so it can become a second Palestinian state. How creating two new Arab Islamic ethno states in the Middle East became a progressive cause? I don't know. Next question comes from Ariel on Instagram Live who asks Any chance a new government in Gaza can be created in collaboration with new Palestinian leaders and the help of the UAE and Egypt? Israel very much wants to see the Palestinians of Gaza running the Gaza Strip. It wants the local community leaders there to take responsibility for their communities, distribute aid in a way that makes sure it doesn't go to Hamas, to build homes without the tunnels going, without the concrete going into tunnels underneath people's homes, to build a peaceful future for Gaza instead of a future of death and destruction. But Hamas doesn't want that. And the brave few community leaders who have stood up and tried to cooperate with Israel for the benefit of their communities, the clan leaders, have found themselves murdered by Hamas. Because Hamas is a threat not only to the people of Israel, but to the people of Gaza itself. Hamas is a death cult. Hamas is a death cult that is determined to use the Gaza Strip as a springboard for terrorism against Israel and brutally suppresses anyone who thinks that a forever war against Israel is a bad idea. But if we're going to see a peaceful future in the Gaza Strip, there needs to be the involvement of neighboring countries. Because Saudi Arabia and the UAE have done a tremendous job in de-radicalizing their own curricula and their own populations and trying to advance a softer, more moderate form of Islam, not the jihadi death cult that Hamas is trying to advance. And I very much hope, personally, that it's possible to bring on board the Gulf countries to rebuild Gaza in a sustainable way. And critically, 
make sure that the aid and the concrete and the resources that go in after this war are used to rebuild Gaza as a permanent home for the people of Gaza, instead of building the network of terror tunnels that brought us the October 7th massacre. Next question comes from Yael Tia, who asks, why doesn't Israel allow journalists inside Gaza? Since the beginning of the war and before, Israel has barred international journalists from entering the Gaza Strip on grounds that it is concerned that they could expose troop movements. That there are, if there are journalists inside the Gaza Strip, they could give away where Israeli soldiers are and that would put them in even greater danger than they are. This argument by the Israeli government was accepted by the Supreme Court that accepted those security reasons. Now, I imagine there are other reasons as well. It would be a nightmare if, God forbid, you were to have a CNN or Fox News reporter in the Gaza Strip get killed because it's a war zone. It's dangerous and Israel doesn't want journalists to get killed. That's why it lets them in on embed missions where it takes them in with the army to show them things in the Gaza Strip instead of letting them go uh, and have free reign. The important thing to remember is there is no such thing as free access for the media in Gaza, even if Israel were to let them in. And that's because in areas that are not, are not under Israel's control, are under Hamas control. And Hamas does not allow journalists to report freely from inside Gaza. Even in previous rounds, journalists never revealed information about how Hamas was shooting rockets from inside civilian areas or hijacking aid because they knew that Hamas would intimidate them, rip up their cameras and not allow them to film. Instead, we end up with a situation now where the information coming out of Gaza comes from local Palestinian Gazan journalists. Now, the international media want to have their cake and eat it. On the one hand, they say, we need to get the international media into Gaza. We need our own journalists into Gaza to report freely. But then they say, the information we get from the Gazan journalists on the ground is perfectly reliable anyway. Well, which is it? Do you need to get your European journalists into Gaza because you can't trust the quality of the reporting of the Gazan reporters? Or do you trust the quality of the Gazan reporters? Now, those reporters are problematic. Many of them work for Hamas, okay? Do we remember just when the three hostages were rescued together with Noah Agamani? They were held in the home of a Palestine Chronicle journalist. Many of them uh, work for Hamas. Others are simply Hamas content creators because they work for Al-Aqsa TV, for example. And others, in the best case scenario, are simply cowed or intimidated by Hamas because it, it runs a brutal authoritarian state that tells people what they are allowed to say. And so it means that Israel is paying a certain price by not allowing journalists into Gaza in order to protect the troops whose movements would otherwise be exposed by having journalists filming and potentially passing on those materials to terrorists inside Gaza. So I hope that helps to explain some of the complexities and dilemmas around the question of the international media inside Gaza. Next question comes from, as told by a Jew mum who writes, how will the hate be eradicated from Gaza? How can hate be eradicated from Gaza? It's going to require the people of Gaza to make a brave decision at the end of this war. And that's to ask why it started. It's to realize that terrorism has led them to a dead end and that it doesn't pay. When countries around the world, by the way, reward Hamas for the October 7th massacre, such as by recognizing a non-existent Palestinian state, they're telling them that terror pays. When they send more money to UNRWA, they tell them that terror pays. We'll eradicate hate from Gaza when people inside Gaza realize that that strategy hasn't worked for them, that they need to take responsibility and work towards a more peaceful future. The tragic thing is so much of the hate and anti-Semitism and jihad inside Gaza has been taught not by the Palestinian Authority and not by Hamas, but by the United Nations, by UNRWA, which runs schools for 70% of children inside Gaza, that indoctrinates them, that teaches them to glorify jihad, that teaches them that they are refugees and Gaza is not their real home and Israel has no right to exist and one day through violent struggle, they will take over Israel from the river to the sea. If we want to have peace between Israel and our neighbors in Gaza, and we really, really do, believe us, we're sick of this conflict, there needs to be de-radicalization 
Prime Minister Netanyahu has set out his vision of what he calls the 3D vision for peace. Destroying Hamas, demilitarizing Gaza, and de-radicalizing Palestinian society. We have to make sure that Palestinian children are taught to embrace peace and coexistence with Israel rather than pursuing jihad in order to destroy Israel. And if, I don't know where you're watching from, but if your government continues to send money to UNRWA to indoctrinate Palestinian children that Israel should be destroyed and that jihad is a noble value, unfortunately, we will find ourselves in conflict again with Gaza, whether Hamas controls it or anyone else. Our last question today comes from Nil I Am on Instagram, who asks, what should us regular people without a significant platform or followers do this week? Get off social media and speak to people in the real world. Speak to friends, speak to colleagues, speak to families. Have those difficult conversations about Israel. Take the information and the talking points that we are giving you through the Israeli citizen spokesperson's office and engage them in real conversations with people who maybe you're scared to have conversations with them about Israel because you're worried about losing friends. But I don't care. Many Israelis have also lost friends in this war because they were mowed down at a music festival or because they were killed in battle or taken hostage into Gaza, not because they had an argument about politics. So it doesn't matter how many followers you have on Instagram or Twitter. Connect to your social circles, to non-Jews, to potential allies. Speak up for Israel, speak up for the truth, speak up for the Jewish people. Conversation by conversation, I believe we really can win the battle for global public opinion. Ultimately, Israel is not asking for too much for the right of its people to live here in peace and safety. And together with your help, I know we're going to achieve it. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, as always, please follow, subscribe on all various social media platforms. Please share our content. Please use those talking points, get out of social media and use them in the real world. As always, you can submit the questions in advance and the citizen spokesperson's office will be back again, same time tomorrow, 3 p.m. Israel time, 8 a.m. Eastern. Thank you very much.